chapter four reviews measuring behavior. So the next step in the behavior analytic process after we've selected and defined behavior would be to devise a way to measure the behavior. When we measure behavior, it provides us with three pieces of information. It provides a description, essentially by attaching a number to the event, it sort of distinguishes it from other events. So we can see um, a behavior occur in time or occur multiple times through an observation and so forth. <clears throat> the next uh, function of measurement is comparison. So as we measure behavior, either at two different points in time, or perhaps we measure it repeatedly, we can make comparisons of one measure to another, right? So if I measure uh, an instance of out-of-seat behavior during one day, and then I measure out-of-seat behavior the following day, I could compare those two and see how the behavior has changed. The last function measurement is prediction. So if I have repeated descriptions of behavior or any event for that matter, it gives me some historical basis to make a prediction about what might occur. So the functions of measurement provide us with a lot of information. The other thing about measuring behavior is that it provides us with information related to uh, how effective we are in terms of intervening or developing interventions to change behavior. One of the things we do in behavior analysis, which will be the topic of uh, the next section, is we graph the data. So if we conduct an observation, let's just say for 30 minutes, I observe a student in the classroom and I measure their behavior according to the uh, operational definition. That record is then converted to uh, some type of a measure and I graph the data. So these are example data, something that comes out of uh, the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. Uh, we'll learn about reading graphs in the next chapter, so I'm not going to go through each component of the graph. But what you can notice here is that the top panel of the graph is showing some data, right? So this says problem behavior. I understand it's a little blurry there. And we could see that under a baseline condition, problem behavior is occurring roughly around two times per minute target response is permanent on what we call the y-axis. When an intervention is put in place, we see the target behavior drop to near zero levels. This other set of data is communication. So this particular intervention was one in which we taught the individual to communicate. <clears throat> so you know, we'll talk more about that when we get into interventions. So by Measuring the target response or, or multiple target responses is going to provide us with a basis for making decisions regarding treatment. And that's particularly important. So if we're working with a target behavior that is observable, there are um, product permanent product measures that we discussed in the last chapter. So the outcome, what's left after a behavior occurs, um, but there's also a, a process of observable events. So this is sort of indicating that if I can set up an observation, I could see the behavior occur repeatedly in time, as opposed to the outcome that once the behavior is done, there's an outcome and that's the end of it. So this chapter, we're going to focus primarily on process observation. That said, we can use outcome observations or outcome measures. The, there's an advantage in that it does not require us to be present to observe the specific behavior. The disadvantage, as noted last time, is uh, some outcomes can be produced by other behaviors, so it's not clear whether or not the particular outcome correlates with a certain amount of behavior that occurred. So we're going to focus primarily on process observation. The main advantage of observing the process or you know, behavior as it unfolds in the environment is that we could accommodate a wide range of behaviors to, to observe. The disadvantage is that this requires a system to account for multiple behavior dimensions. And we'll make sense of this uh, on the next slide. But specifically, um, when we come up with a measure to capture behavior, we need to figure out what dimension of that behavior are we going to measure. 
the dimensions that can be measured are um, unique to each behavior, but certainly we, we'll, we'll talk about this on the next slide, but all behavior has a property. There are fundamental qualities of the behavior. Um, the dimensional qualities are those that could be quantified so that we could attach a value or a number to. Um, and then we, we can sort of convert that to units of measurement. So how are we going to uh, take the dimension we measure and convert it to a unit, something that we can use in our analysis? <clears throat> so all that aside, what we're talking about here is measuring a particular dimension of behavior. If you think about a behavior, behavior has what we might consider a temporal dimension, meaning it occurs for some period of time, right? If I uh, start talking my, uh, and I keep talking, that occurs for a particular amount of time. If somebody asks me a question, time passes and then I answer the question. So the, the place where the, the answer occurred is another dimension that could be captured. A very common dimension of behavior that we measure is that of repeatability, right? So once again, if we are observing a, a client during a certain period of time, we can count the target behavior as it occurs. So for example, if it is head banging, we could count over the period of say 10 minutes or 30 minutes or an entire day how many head bangs actually occur. Often, when we utilize a count, we will convert that measure to what's called a frequency, and that's simply just the count divided by the observation time. And we'll, go, we'll go through some examples in the next slide. Uh, we'll save the, our discussion of inner response time for that particular slide. <clears throat> so let's talk about the uh, measure of latency. This is not a common measure that's used, but certainly it's one that, that pops up every so often in the behavior analytic research. And it could be useful in practice as well. So latency is the duration of time between a stimulus onset and the occurrence of a behavior. So for an example, stimulus onset might be an instruction. So in this example here, um, point to red. So the teacher may say point to red, and then we start a timer, and then the student points to red, and we stop the timer. So that time between the instruction and when the behavior was initiated is called a latency. So uh, latency can be useful, particularly when working with individuals with developmental disabilities who have communication deficits. So you could imagine, and in fact, I worked with an individual when you would ask them a question like, what is your name? There would be a long pause before they would actually provide their name. So one of the uh, the goals we had for that individual was to decrease the latency between when somebody asked his name and when he actually provided his name. Because again, if you wait uh, 30 seconds or even a minute before you answer the question or respond to what is your name, that can be a little bit stigmatizing. So that was something that, that we worked on. So we're, we latency is a measure that could be used. So here's another example here and something that hopefully illustrates this better for you. Um, so you're at a red light, then there's a stimulus onset, a green light, time elapses, and then the driver begins to drive. All right, so again, you, uh, I'm sure many of you have experienced this where the person in front of you, uh, the light is green and there's a super long latency, maybe 45 seconds, maybe longer before they begin to drive. So. I mean, we might want to design interventions to decrease the latency uh, between when the light turns green and when the person in front of you actually goes. <clears throat> okay, another dimension is duration. This is simply the time from behavior onset to behavior offset or the end of the behavior, the amount of time in which the behavior occurs. So a duration measure uh, is very useful for measuring targets like on task behavior, so how uh, the, the student being engaged. Are they engaged with the material? Are the uh, teacher as he or she lectures? Are they not engaged? So on task behavior is uh, commonly used with a duration measure. 
out of seat behavior is another one. So students who are disruptive in the classroom may get out of their seat. <clears throat> so we could use a duration to measure how long they got out of their seat. So once again, using that driver uh, driving example, uh, the response begins. So the person starts driving and they drive for a certain amount of time before they come to a stop. And this time is the duration. Okay. Now we don't simply use duration in, in isolation, simply measuring, uh, for example, one instance of out of seat behavior, how long it occurred. We measure it repeatedly, right? So one instance of out of seat behavior may have occurred for 10 seconds. The next one may have occurred for 30 seconds. But if we have a defined observation time, we're going to uh, calculate a percentage of out of seat behavior. Again, another reason we, why we select something like a duration is because it, we're trying to represent the best aspect or the best dimension of the behavior. So we could, we, we could capture a count of out of seat behavior, um, but that might not represent what's truly occurring. So imagine a scenario where we are using a count and we count that the student uh, got up out of his seat four times in in a day right that may not seem like a lot but if each time he was out of a seat it was up to five minutes or ten minutes cert suddenly we, we get sort of a different picture of the response shifting to the dimension of repeatability the primary um, measure here is a count so simply measuring each instance of behavior so in this example here we have each occurrence of self-injurious behavior so we set up an observation for 10 minutes and we simply count each time the client uh, engages in the behavior so from this <clears throat> in 10 minutes the client engaged in seven instances of sib we could convert this to a frequency so count divided by time sometimes known as a rate that would be uh, seven instances divided by the 10 minutes. So we have 0.7 SIBs per minute. Another measure that sometimes comes in handy when we're developing interventions is called an inter-response time. Uh, I'm not gonna require you understand this for, for the exam, but uh, given it, it's in the textbook, it's worth going over. So an inter-response time is simply the amount of time that elapses between two responses. So if I took that 10 minute observation from the last slide and uh, I'm counting SIB, but what I'm looking at specifically is the time, really the duration uh, between each instance of SIB. So we might see that SIB occurs at you know, maybe one minute and then there's 3.5 minutes that passes before the next instance of SIB. And then you know, we look again and we see that there's four minutes it elapses <clears throat> until the next instance of SIB. So these measures uh, come in handy when we're trying to develop interventions. And I'll, I'll kind of put it clearly here and just say that one of the ways that we could use the IRT is to determine on average, when does the target behavior occur? If we figure that out, let's just say, for example, it is uh, on average, it occurs every three and a half minutes. Well, we could design interventions that sort of uh, intervene before the average time that the behavior is going to occur. So we could either eliminate or prevent the behavior from occurring. <clears throat> so in a response time can, can be useful in that sense. When we're trying to select the, the dimensions to measure, um, and you don't have to say dimensions, you simply say when we're developing the measurement procedures, we, we have to really carefully select them. Some behaviors certainly lend themselves to particular measures, as indicated, out of seat is best measured with the duration. Things that we can count easily should probably be measured using a count. Some of the things that we might use to guide the, the selection of an appropriate measurement system might be depending on if we're doing research, what is the experimental question? Um, or if you look into the literature, the research on 
different target behaviors. So for example, if I'm working with an individual who uh, engages in food refusal, common in, in some individuals with autism, I might look to, to the literature to see what types of measures were used in those studies. Uh, again, sometimes the target behavior will suggest what type of measurement you should use. A basic rule of thumb here is if you could count it, you probably should count it. So those are the dimensions of measurement. Uh, I'll, I'll show some examples of data sheets. The textbook has some nice examples of data sheets. Uh, but the other thing we need to think about is the actual observation. So when we are working clinically or, or really in research as well, we identify the target behavior, we define it, we come up with a measurement system, and then we determine when to observe or, or how, how much we're going to record during an observation. So observation times are important. Uh, obviously, we want to get the true sense of the behavior as it occurs in the natural environment. So we try to set up our observations two times when the target behavior is going to be occurring. Um, on an inpatient setting, uh, I worked on an inpatient setting for many years, we would conduct behavior sessions or therapy sessions um, for a couple hours each day with the client. So they're admitted to the hospital, we'd run through assessments, and then we'd run through evaluating interventions. And generally speaking, we would use complete observations. So uh, during our observations, which were sort of carved up into 10 minute observations or sessions, we would collect data continuously and we'd have a complete picture of what happened. In other settings, however, it's difficult to capture um, a complete observation. So we might elect to use an incomplete observation or sort of a sample of what occurred. So in, in those instances, we rely on what's called interval recording or discontinuous sampling methods. This is yet another data collection method. But essentially, we define our observation time, and in this example, I have a 10-minute observation. We take that 10-minute observation and we divide it into equal interval length. So let's just say 10 one-minute intervals. Then we could apply or utilize one of these recording methods. And I'm going to uh, give you some examples of these, but the first one is whole interval recording and uh, we score a response if it occurs through the entire interval. The next one is partial interval recording, where we score a response if it occurs during any portion of the interval. And the last one is momentary time sampling. We only score the response if it occurs at the end of the interval. Okay, so that's quite a bit there and probably pretty difficult to, to understand. So let's try to look at it uh, through an illustration. Okay, what this is illustrating are the different measurement systems uh, during an observation. So I realize this might be a, a bit of a stretch, but imagine this line here is indicating the passage of time. So this is our observation. So let's just say I'm working in an inpatient setting. I bring my client into the session room and I begin my session and time elapses. Okay, and it ends. Let's just say these are 10 minute observations. So I'm observing and recording data on my client in that 10 minutes. And behavior is free to occur. So let's just say I'm targeting um, bizarre speech. Okay, so um, I'm simply measuring each time bizarre speech occurs. And as you can imagine, there could be different durations bizarre speech and different instances. <clears throat> so uh, if I start, if bizarre speech occurs, I start recording and I get you know, one instance for a certain amount of time. Here's another instance for another amount of time and so forth. So I come up with these different instances in time. Now, if I consider the different measures that I could use, each of them are gonna reflect something a little bit different. So if I were to utilize a count or a frequency, there are eight instances of bizarre speech. One, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, and eight. If I measure a duration, that means I'm capturing the amount of time each instance occurred, it might turn out to be, in this case, 54%. So 54% of this 10 minute session, 54% of the time, the client was engaged in bizarre speech. So that's sort of the behavior stream. Now, um, let's look at the different discontinuous sampling methods, whole interval, partial interval, and momentary time sampling. So imagine same scenario, but instead of using a frequency or a duration, I elect to use whole interval for recording. And I've uh, let's just say I have a computer that um, beeps you know, every one minute and indicates which interval I'm recording data in. <clears throat> so same behavioral stream applied. Recall that in whole interval recording, the response is scored only if it occurs during the entire interval. So I start observing. There is no bizarre speech. It begins in the middle of interval one, but it ends before the interval times out. So it doesn't actually get scored there. Time passes, we come to interval three, there's bizarre speech occurring and it occurs all the way to the end. So I would score that bizarre speech occurred. <clears throat> okay, so I'd go in, the, in that sort of methodology there. And you could see if I utilize or apply that method, it's only gonna capture that one response occurred. So 10% of the intervals had an instance of bizarre speech, okay? So you could see the artifact of measuring using whole interval recording results in an underestimation of the amount of behavior that occurred. <clears throat> so you have to keep in mind, here we're getting the entire picture, the complete record. Here we're only getting a sample or an estimate. So the next thing that you notice uh, here is, or that you might consider, is if we shorten or narrow the intervals, we might capture more behavior. The problem is it's, it's a little more uh, labor intensive to do that. Looking at partial interval recording, the response is scored if it occurs during any portion of the interval. Okay, so again, same data stream, different measurement system, um, and we see that in interval one, the response occurred, interval two, it occurred near the end, interval three, it occurred, and so forth. So here, if we use apply this, measure, this method of measurement, we get nine responses out of the 10 intervals. So 90% of the intervals contained bizarre speech, okay? Um, and you know, what that ends up doing is the artifact is that it overestimates how much behavior occurred. So yes, behavior occurred in nine of the 10 intervals, but some of the intervals it only occurred for a very brief amount of time. <clears throat> the last one, momentary time sampling, um, is when the response is scored if it occurs at the end of the interval. Okay, so um, once again, same data stream, uh, behavior would not be scored here. It would be scored here because it's occurring at the end of the interval, it's scored here, here, and so forth. So here we get five out of the 10 intervals had bizarre speech, and that is 50%. Uh, <clears throat> so the errors or the estimate errors are, are sort of random. So given there are these artifacts of estimation, why would we elect to use a discontinuous sampling method as opposed to a continuous method where we could capture the entire record? Well, turns out, particularly in applied settings, um, getting people to collect data is pretty labor intensive. So one of the things we might do to make the job of data collection a little easier is utilize a sampling method. Uh, for example, momentary time sampling. <clears throat> now, if we would use this measure, um, it doesn't actually require the data collector observe the person the entire time, right? So a teacher, for example, can do all the things a teacher needs to do, but when the interval time times out, maybe you have a little uh, timer that beeps, they look at the student and see if he or she is engaged in the behavior and they record yes or no. So it's sort of a, a, an easier way or a less labor intensive way to capture data. 
So that's sort of one example. <clears throat> uh, with partial interval recording, once again, it, it's an estimate. So if we're not really interested in how many times the behavior occurred, we're just interested in yes or no did the behavior occur. This method is, is great to use. So once again, it's less labor intensive because the data collector doesn't have to count how many times the behavior occurs or even capture the duration. They just simply need to indicate yes or no, did the behavior occur in the given time interval. Okay, so <clears throat> those are really the, the primary measures that are used in behavior analysis. I also mentioned uh, briefly about the observation. How do we set up the observation? Well, when we're involved in clinical work, we need to think about that. Um, will the participant be in one place or will they be moving around? Uh, will it be possible to see the target behavior? Will the participants be alone or interacting with others? All of these things can impact our observation and our ability to record data during our observation. So we need to consider that. How are the observation periods defined? Uh, again, are they continuous across a specified time period? Are they conducted in sessions? So for example, I like to work in sessions where I observe for 10 minutes, I record data, I do whatever interventions I'm doing or assessment, and then I take a break. I come back and I run another 10 minute observation. <clears throat> okay, so my data are collected during these brief observation periods. Sometimes we collect um, data trial by trial, right? So if we're teaching a particular skill, we might run discrete trials where we deliver an instruction, we wait for a response, and we reinforce that response. In terms of scheduling observations, again, we have a lot of flexibility in the way we do that, but the, the sort of rule of thumb is we want to make sure that the data or the observation represents the true and natural state of the target behavior. So if we learn through, say, a teacher interview that the student um, is very disruptive in the PM, the afternoon session in school, we would not really want to conduct our observations during the morning session because we're not going to see the target behavior. So we try to make sure we schedule our observations at the times when the behavior is actually occurring. So again, just some general guidelines of uh, what measure would we use? Well, if the behavior can be counted, that, that is, it has a discrete start and ending, we would use a count or frequency. If behavior is quickly repeated and it's difficult to count or has no discrete start or ending, duration is a good measure. If um, Behavior requires a duration measure to reflect accurate representation, right? So as I indicated, out of seat behavior, right? There may only be two instances, but if each of them are five minutes or 10 minutes, we want to make sure that we're accurately representing how much of that behavior occurred. Okay, so those are some general guidelines. Let me uh, shift gears and, and show you some data sheets. Okay, these are sort of samples um, of data sheets. So you can imagine if this were pen and paper, and I'll, I'll, I will actually have a um, sort of comprehensive video to describe the entire behavior analytic process from start to finish. Uh, so I'll make that available to you um, probably during the third, possibly fourth week of class. So uh, <clears throat> let's just say, for example, I wanna work on teaching an individual a social greeting. So we're going to define it as the individual vocalizes hello in the presence of a peer. And I set up a observation context and uh, a setting in which to collect data. But I'm going to collect trial based data. So trial by trial. And I'm going to use basically um, really sort of like a whole interval recording system in a way. So during the trial, did a social greeting occur or not occur? Yes or no? All right, so I'd go through and circle. Yes, maybe trial two, it did not occur. Trial three, didn't occur, and so forth. So I continue through 10 trials, and there are seven occurrences of the social greeting 
out of the 10 trials. So I would plot on a graph 70%. So during this first session consisting of 10 trials, 70% of them contained uh, <clears throat> an instance of the social greeting. If we go over to this data sheet, um, here I've divided a 10 minute observation into 10 one minute intervals. Okay. And I'm simply going to record each instance of SIB. So time goes on. I have a little timer and it beeps every one minute. Um, I see in interval one, there was no SIB, in interval two, uh, two, two instances, and so forth. So simply, I'm, I'm recording each time the client engages in self injurious behavior according to this definition. At the end of the observation, I do a little calculation and I see there are 16 instances of self injurious behavior during the 10 minute session. So I could convert that to SIBs per minute, 1.6. Okay, so that's sort of one example. One of the things I will do with the data that I collected is I will graph the data. And we're gonna talk about graphing in the next section, but um, here's an example of what that might look like. So I take my raw data from the paper and pencil data sheet and I enter it into Excel. And uh, here I see the occurrence of the social greeting under what we're gonna call a baseline. I'll explain that later. Uh, and I plot the data, right? So now I have a visual representation of the level of the social greeting. And I see that it's occurring about 10% of the uh, trials. Okay, here's another example of some data sheets. Let me see if I can make this a little larger. Um, so this might be something that I'd print out, right? I have time going down one column and I divide my time here in the 30 minute intervals and I have places to record the frequency of certain behaviors. So aggression, self-injury, property destruction, and so forth. And you can see there's operational definitions down at the bottom and so forth. So the idea here is uh, <clears throat> during my observations, I would use a status sheet and it would be on a clipboard and I could record with a pen or a pencil how many times each of these occurred. I also see that there's some other measures in here. So, um, you know, we could customize these to meet our needs. Here's yet another data sheet or another example of a data sheet. So this one, um, you know, just slight, format it slightly differently. We have sessions and maybe these are instances where we could record a certain target behavior. Okay, more examples. So we, we tend to create these and customize them to meet the needs of our assessment or interventions, um, but they're again, uniquely designed to, um, to capture the behavior of our particular individual or client. Okay, so that is it about um, measurement. The next section um, we'll be looking at graphing, but the, the thing I want you to keep in mind here as we go through this, <clears throat> these chapters is what we're currently talking about are the initial steps of the behavior analytic process when we're trying to um, target behaviors to change we identify them first or target them, then we define them, and then we devise a measurement system. We think about how are we going to measure this behavior. And measurement is important because it provides us with information that helps describe the behavior that's occurring in terms of a number or level, uh, <clears throat> but it also allows for points of comparison. So one of the things we're going to do eventually is we will compare the level of behavior, our measurement, under a baseline condition before we intervene. And then of course, we're gonna measure it while we intervene or after we intervene. And we're gonna see if there's a change in behavior.